All right, so, hi, my name is Charlie Klein. I'm going to be talking about React Hooks. I guess about a year ago, Larry gave a talk on React Hooks, but that's when they just, they were like brand new. And I, his, his talk was like, wow, there's this amazing new thing coming. Uh, so he and I talked about it, and we thought it might not be a bad time to actually revisit this now that a lot of us have a lot of experience with them and so on. Um, nice lag. Um, oh, right, because this is going through the Zoom. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, yeah, so that's me. That's my Twitter and that's my GitHub. There's not a lot up on the GitHub. I, I steal more stuff than I contribute, unfortunately, on GitHub. Uh, just like two seconds about me. I, I'm an old timer. I worked for about 30 plus years at the university doing network engineering. So I was a network guy since before the internet days. So I was around for the beginning of the internet uh, as network speeds went from like one megabit to 10 gigabits. So that was that was a rocking career, but uh, I retired from that. Uh, spent two years retooling on modern software development. Well, I don't know if you consider Ruby, Sinatra, and jQuery modern, but it was more modern than what I knew. Uh, and I'm not going to tell you which company I was working at while I was doing that, or you would throw tomatoes at me. But he's <laughs> one of the more hated people here in Champaign. Um, <laughs> <Let me know. laughs> um, yeah, so then I got hired by Instructure, which if you've not heard of them, is a learning management company uh, headquartered in Salt Lake City. I'm a remote engineer. I work out of the M2 building. Uh, they make Canvas, which is the premier uh, learning management system for K through 20. And that's been a real ride because I turned my Ruby and jQuery into Ruby on Rails, ES6, React, and my favorite language is Clojure but I almost never get to write in it. We have one little tiny microservice that's in Clojure, but that's okay. And when I'm not doing that, I teach people to fly planes. So that's me. Um, so before we, well, all right, let me, so I'm gonna talk about React class components and function components. There's two different ways to write a component in React. Uh, what's good and lacking about each, and if we want to use function components to do everything that class components do, what's missing from them? And spoiler alert, they're missing what turned out to be hooks. Uh, I'll talk about the built-in hooks that will let you write a function component to do everything that a class component did. And then I want to talk about custom hooks. I've got a really good example that's, um, uh, that I kind of stole out of Canvas that we worked on. Uh, so I want to demonstrate that too. But before we go on, uh, would you guys prefer that I spend more time like reiterating the beginnings of hooks and teaching you how to use them? Or do you want me to kind of fly through that part and go on to like how to write a custom hook stuff? Does anybody really care? Or should I just kind of go at a, at a common pace through it all? I'm seeing people going like shrug emoji. So, all right, I'll just kind of go at a decent speed through this. Um, all right, so in the beginning when React first came out, you created a React class by just calling a function called react.createClass. That's so old now, I haven't seen any code that does anything like that in a long time, so I'm not even gonna mention it beyond this. Uh, mostly these days, we're writing components as JavaScript classes that extend react.component. Uh, so then each component is an instance of that class. If I have a button component and I've got five of them on my screen, I have five instances of that class that React is, is interacting with to render the five different uh, five different buttons on the screen. Then there's function components, which are just as they sound. They're just JavaScript functions, uh, and it renders JSX, which is this HTML-ish thing, although one of the first things I learned when I was learning React is that JSX, it's not HTML, and it's not JavaScript, it's JSX. So um, who, who has tried to put a JavaScript comment right in the middle of JSX? And it just explodes, right? Um, but anyway. Uh, so it's HTML-ish stuff that you feed to React and, it, and then the, it does its magic and puts it on the browser screen. Um, all right, so if we're writing class components, so here's where I need to do this. Um, if we're writing class components, so again, it's just a class that extends react.component. Since it's a class, there's a constructor, we can set the initial state. Uh, and then at some point there's a render method that just returns, and this is the JSX that looks kind of like HTML. You can use common HTML things like divs and buttons. Uh, so here, so all the, all the instance variables are this dot something, which would be normal for a class, and React manages a thing called state. So we start out the state with a count of zero, 
And then we have a couple of buttons that have on clicks to do this count up and count down. And the count up adds one to the count and the countdown subtracts one from the count. So if we click on these buttons, that count will, will um, go up and down. And every time we change the state with this state, that triggers React to re-render the component. So it calls the render method again. So this works exactly how you'd expect. You click on increment, it goes one, two, three, four, five, and everybody can be proud of writing their first React app. Um, so the state's required, in this case, it should be obvious because we need this component to keep track of what that value is. We have to have a place to stash it. And classes are kind of natural for that because you have class variables, and, uh, and um, in this case, this.state, which React is managing. But therein, we, you know, we start getting into a little bit of, um, the awkwardness of classes uh, for React components. Because you might think that, you know, this dot x, y, z, that's just an instance variable, but this dot state isn't. That, I mean, it is, but it's magic and you can't really touch it. If you try directly touching this dot state, really terrible things will happen. Will happen. Uh, if you're lucky, your linter will catch you before that happens. Um, so it's a little bit awkward. There's a couple of things that look like classes, but they really aren't. So here's, yeah. so here's an example of a function component. No, notice how much easier this is, right? So this is a function. Um, so it's just a, an error function and it takes props and it just directly returns the JSX. That's all this does. So it takes a prop, inside that prop is a name and it renders three spans and says, hello, your name, how are you today? Uh, so this is much simpler. There's no this to worry about because we're not talking about class instances or object instances. But because this is a function that executes once and then exits, we can't, we have no place to stash state values in here. Uh, we could try putting them outside the function, but then what if we need more than one of these, right? Um, so function components are great for simple things like this. If you need to keep state or manage lifecycle, they don't really work, which is why we were stuck with uh, class components for so long. So the good things about class components we were sort of talking about, um, you can have instance variables, just you know, this dot XXX or anything that React isn't already using. You can manage a lot of stuff. What can be nice about them if, is if you're testing with something like Enzyme, you can poke at your component instance with tests. You can have Enzyme render your component and then you get back the, um, of the class instance in your tests. You can actually call the internal functions and do unit tests on them, which can be nice sometimes. Um, you can poke at the state and the props directly. Uh, that can make tests a little bit easier. Uh, so they're a little bit easier to test. What's bad about them though, is that everything in the component instance is a property of this, right? Because that's how class instances work. But that's okay, except, let's go back to this example here, except when you pass a function outside of the component, like we're doing with count up here. If we pass that function as a callback to the button, and then if the user clicks on that, what's the value of this, right? In, in a traditional function, this is the context of the caller. So the first thing that happens is this function starts to run, and we do this dot set state. Well, there's no window dot set state, and this is gonna explode. So you have to remember what we always did when I, uh, when, uh, when we were working on this hidden structure is you have to bind all those things that you're gonna pass out to this so that when they get called, uh, they uh, have the proper this. Now you can use arrow functions because an arrow function uh, has what's called lexical this. Um, where am I? The iPad shows me the next slide, which is really confusing me. Um, so if you use arrow functions, they have lexical this. So in, a, in an arrow function, this is the context in which the function was defined. In a traditional function, it's the context in which the function was called, uh, which is what creates this uh, confusion. So you, know, you could just use arrow functions and avoid this, but in real life experience, we had things that leaked out to prod all the time that were due to this. So it's a real bug maker. Uh, and then there's the React component lifecycle. So it's expected to be managed by the component itself. If you've written a React class component, you've got um, 
component uh, did mount, component did update, component will unmount, uh, a component will receive props. And those are all functions that you're supposed to put inside your function to manage them, uh, which is weird because you, know, you would think React would do that, and it sort of does, but not really. You have to help it out quite a bit. Um, and I don't know if this is a good thing to say or not, but once you, once you start using classes, you've turned JavaScript into a fully Java-like object-oriented language and it's tempting to just use classes everywhere. And then you have class inheritance and superclasses and subclasses. And I'm gonna make the editorial statement that JavaScript is not real good at that. It is not Java. It wasn't built from the ground up that way. Uh, they were added fairly late. I think in ES6 was when they first showed up for real. So yeah, so we don't really, like to use them a lot. We use them for React classes, but that's it. Um, you know, you would much rather be doing things in a modern way with function composition. All right. So in function components, the, all the lifecycle management is handled by React. We can't do anything because we're just a function that runs and returns JSX and exits. Um, the good news, so that's good. What else is good is there's no awkward object property issues. There's none of this, this stuff to worry about, which is kind of like a breath of fresh air. But the bad news is they kind of leave no traces behind. You can't keep state with them directly. And there's no way to alter the usual React rendering flow. It calls you, you get props, you return JSX, and that's all you get to do. So if JS classes aren't the best fit for writing React components, uh, because they're new, whereas you know, function semantics are old and very well understood, um, the semantics of this are really confusing. Uh, so they made this decision, I'm going to paraphrase, like render unto React the things that are React. Like let it keep track of all this. It's there all the time anyway, right? Like React is constantly loaded. Uh, did that skip a slide? No. So all we need is some way to write function components in ways that let us do all these things that we can't do. So hooks are a way to manage state and life cycle side effects from within a single function. So that way we get like everything we need, everything we've been using with class instances. But how are we gonna do that if function components are run and done? Well, we'll let React do it, because it's already doing it. It's already managing rendering, it's already making the decisions about whether to re-render components because their props have changed or some parent is dirty. It's already keeping track of when to unmount components because a parent has unmounted. It's already doing all that. Um, and it's there constantly. So we just need a way to hook into it to ask it to manage our state and lifecycle stuff for us. So let's talk about hooks. They always uh, start with the word use. That's the convention, that's the naming convention. So you know, there's use state, use effect, or some of the standard ones. And when you write a custom one, the the, uh, you'll follow that naming convention too. So when you write a custom hook, it'll be use something. Uh, now there's standard ones. I've found that you can use use state and use effect and forget about all the other ones and you can get about 95% of what you want to get done done. Uh, some of the other ones are actually really cool, but, uh, but those two are the two big ones and I'll talk about those. And you can write your own if you want to do something that's hook-like that's not provided by React. You can write your own. Okay, oh good, he muted, excellent. <laughs> um, <clears throat> All right, so let me talk about some basic ones here. The, uh, the first one that we all use is use state. That's the first thing I was talking about. If we're not writing, if our component isn't a class instance, how do we keep state? Well, we ask React to keep state for us. Uh, you can call this as many times as you need. If I need a value and a time and a pattern or something, I can call use state lots of times. Uh, so there's an example of it. Um, what use state does, it takes an initial value so it takes an initial value here and it returns a two element array. So it returns an array that has two things in it. You will almost always just immediately deconstruct that using the JavaScript array deconstructor. Uh, the first element is the action. So that's our actual state value. And the second one is a function that will call to set that. Uh, and the usual React semantics apply. When I set the state, React will, will um, uh, cause us to re-render. Uh, so now think about what happens here when we call um, use state and we get back this value. This, this is just a variable, you know, just like a regular old variable inside our component. If we alter the value of this, 
kind of nothing interesting happens because it's going to go away the minute the function exits. So don't assign it a value. If you want to change it, you have to call that setter. All right. Uh, right. So here's an example of a component. So I'm rewriting that first uh, class component with the stupid little counter that counts up and down with increment and decrement buttons. So we're going to call use state in this function with a count and then the setter. And then the initial value is zero, which is the same as we did in the constructor of that function of the, of the class component. And we have our count up function now just has to call set count and we're going to pass it a function that just increments what it gets and countdown is past the function that decrements what it gets. You can, as I say down here, you can just pass a value. Like if I want to set it to five, I can do that. That was not me. Um, or in this case, if the new value is dependent on the old value, sometimes it's easier to pass a function to it. Um, okay, so then our function then, because it's a function component, just has to return the JSS directly. Uh, so there's no this dot anything. We already have our state in this local variable called count up here. Uh, so we can just put that in the JSX and then our on clicks just mention these functions count up and count down and we're done. That's all we have to do. So there's a function component. It's not a JS class. There's no instances or anything. This is just a function that react calls when it wants to re-render us. We are asking it through this thing to um, manage a piece of state for us. All right, one little gotcha here, and this is the only, the only real big gotcha in all of hooks. Suppose I wanted to manage three things. I have three pieces of state here. I have an input value, I have something called matcher, and then I have something called selected item ID. Those are the three pieces of state. Here's the three setter functions for them. Here's the initial values for these. So now I'm asking React to manage three things for me. How is React going to keep those distinct from one another when it doesn't know what these names are? Like those names are local to my function. React has no idea what it is, right? So the answer, of course, is the only way it knows is by the order in which I call those three. I have to call them in the same order every time, which should be natural because your, your function is going to always look the same. So how React knows that the first one is input value and the second one is the matcher is because I called it first and then I call that one second. Uh, so that means that we get to the one big rule of hooks is you have to call those hooks always at the uh, uh, outside of any um, conditional program logic. If you try to call a hook inside an if statement, then depending on whether or not that if statement's then clause executes, you get different numbers of hooks being called and you can really screw React up. If you're lucky, React will catch you and give you a console error. If you're not, your component just behaves very, very strangely. Uh, so that's the number one rule. You can only call hooks outside of program logic, not, not inside loops or nested functions or if statements, uh, which is usually all that you need anyway. Um, and there's a whole bunch of, um, Facebook wrote a whole bunch of um, linter plugins. There's one called the rules of hooks but if you load that into ESLint, it will, it will catch you when you try to do stuff like this before it starts turning into trouble in your code. All right, so that's all about use state. Let's talk about the other common one, which is use effect. So use state got us our state. What was the other big thing that class components did that function components didn't? That's lifecycle methods. Uh, and in a clever little bit of software design, almost all of the old React class lifecycle methods are all rolled into this one um, use effect hook. And all it does is when you call use effect, you pass it a function. And when React is done rendering your component, so when it takes all your JSX and has turned it into HTML and has put it in the DOM and has committed it to the browser, when all that's done, then it will call your, um, the function that you pass on to use effect. Uh, so what's that? That's exactly what component did update does, right? Um, a change has been made to your component. I'm gonna call this um, lifecycle method so that we can do something. Uh, but we can make it do other things too. So here's an example. Uh, I have a function do something here. 
Um, and what that does is it sets a timeout. So we're going to call this delayed action function that's listed elsewhere. Uh, and we're going to do that in 10 seconds time, 10,000 milliseconds. And then we call use effect on do something. So that means that after our, so maybe this is like a, you have 10 seconds to answer this question, right? So the page loads, there's a button on it to submit your question. And 10 seconds later, we're going to, you know, we're going to um, set the disable property of that um, to turn it off. So that's great uh, because you can't have timers and event handlers as a part of the render. So since we only pass one argument to use effect, we only pass it that one thing, that's going to run every single time the component re-renders, which may or may not be what we want. Now, probably some of you have figured out what the problem is here. That code actually has a terrible bug in it because what if we render, what if React renders the component, calls our use effect, we call that function, we set the timer, 10 seconds later, we want to do something with the DOM, and then the user clicks on some other button, and that component unmounts, and something else happens. 10 seconds later, that set timeout's going to fire, and it's going to try to touch something that no longer exists, and it's going to explode, right? Uh, and I've seen that happen a lot. So this is a little confusing at first, but it's actually really natural. So if the function, if our effect function that we pass the use effect, if that function returns a function, then React will arrange to call that function when it updates the component or unmounts it from the DOM. It says, okay, you know, undo whatever you did. Uh, so that's effectively like component will unmount. So, uh, is that what you said first? Yes, okay. Um, so also, what if we don't want the, if we don't want to run the effect on every um, re-render, what if we only want to call it once? What if we only want to set an event listener when the component first comes up? And if it re-renders or updates, we don't care. So use effect takes a second argument, which we haven't used yet. And that array, that second argument is an array of dependencies, which are just variables from within inside your component. And that will make React only call that effect function on a re-render if at least one of the dependencies has changed. So that might be part of your state, might be part of your props. Um, a big one is you don't care if React re, if, um, React re renders the component if it hasn't touched the thing that you have the event listener on. Maybe you don't care about that. Uh, and so a trick here is you can pass an empty array, which means I'm passing it dependencies, but there aren't any, which means that that's never going to change, which means that React is never going to call this a second time. It's only going to call it once. So that's basically component did mount when you use, use effect that way. So here's an example of both of these. Um, so we did a, we're calling use effect and we're passing it did mount. So this is our did mount function. And it just does something stupid here. It just says, all right, my component is mounted. And then notice that the did mount, so my effect function is returning this other function, uh, which says, okay, my component is about to unmount. And this will do exactly what you would expect when a component is unmounted from the DOM. React will call this will unmount, and then your component unmounts. Um, and we pass it an empty array here, which means that this effect will only be, or that this did mount will only call once, and that's when the component comes up, not if you re-render it. All right. I'm sure it's really, really fast for time. Okay, I'm going to be real fast here. Um, so this is just like normally we wouldn't split all those out into separate functions like that. I just did it for clarity. You would usually see it written more like this, where everything is just piled into a bunch of anonymous functions like that. That's like a more concise way to do it. It's a little bit harder to follow, so I didn't do it that way. I want to talk about one more, which is use ref. So I said the last thing we might want to do in a class component is we could say this.xxx. We can stash something of our own that has nothing to do with React inside the component uh, and just keep it there for us to access. Like if I wanted to keep me uh, thing, I could say this dot keep me equals zero, and it would be around for any method within that uh, class instance to handle. Uh, but these function components are run and done. Like when they exit, all that stuff is gone. So what if we need to keep a value of our own, not having to do with React, for some other purpose? And this seems unrelated, but what if we want to refer to a DOM component that has been rendered? That's, that's why this is called useRef, by the way. So useRef does both. And it's kind of a weird 
thing. Uh, when you call it, it will give you an object. So here's an initial value, and we're gonna stash what it returns in this time called. So that's our ref object. And what React will do is that object always has a property called current that it will keep around for you. And otherwise it won't touch it and won't do anything with it. It just will give it to you when you start running and it will remember all the changes that you made to it. So we could do something like, we could start it out at zero at an initial value and then every time my component runs, I can increment it and then I can return, like look, we've been called this many times. This is a simple example. It's not state. Altering that current value, React has no idea what you've done. It will not re-render you. It won't do anything special. Nothing will tell you when that changes. Um, it's just a way for you to stash things that you need. Um, and if you're wondering where the ref comes from, I can create a ref here. And then when I render it, if I say ref equal and then mention that reference, React will stick a reference to this particular DOM element in that variable. So we can then access input element dot current like we do here and then do things with it if we want. So what this does is it will render an input thing in a button and if you click on the button, it will put the, um, the cursor focus on the input element. This is a simple example. All right, so now you know three React hooks. There's lots more. Um, I'm not going to go into them. Some of them are really, really strange. There's one called use imperative ref, which is a way to pass modified references up to parent components. I've never even imagined when I might use that. But there's others that are actually kind of useful. I'm just not going to talk about it. Like use callback and use memo. Those are actually fairly useful things. The um, react.js documentation on hooks is excellent, by the way. So it's a really good reference. So I want to talk, for the last part of this talk, I want to talk about a custom hook. Uh, so you can write your own, and they let you um, do, um, do your own hook-like things that are uh, specific to your app. So as an example, a lot of times components need to make API calls, and when the, when the result comes back, um, you would um, then set state, and then your component re-renders based on the result of this. So normally we would use use state to hold the results, because we need state. And then we would have a use effect that makes the API call and when it, and then that would deal with setting the state when it, when it, when it completes. So we have stuff that looks like this. This is a super common pattern. Uh, so here's our component. We have, we're tracking one piece of state called a person. Here's the setter. Um, what we return is just this plain old hello thing. That's this hello name of the person. And then we have an effect that whenever, so in the props, there's a URL. Whenever that URL changes, we want to call this get data function. So that's an async function, which means it's going to return right away. But while it's running, we're going to use fetch. We're going to use the fetch API to go get something from the net, uh, djsonify it. And then when it completes, we're going to set our state to that object that came back from the API. Once that set happens, our component re-renders, and we wind up with the name down here like we want. Super common pattern, this happens a lot. But let's think about this for a second. That use effect, that happens when the components already run, when React is completely done with it and committed it to the DOM, all right? We could make this perform a little bit better. There's no reason that we have to wait for the whole component to render before we make an API call, right? So we could gain some performance by figuring out a way to make that call earlier. Uh, and then all we have to do, so that, API call could be in flight while React is still doing its work. And then when that completes, we set state and that'll re-render the component and it'll just fill in the little bits that we need. So let's come up with some custom hooks that do this. We're gonna call it use immediate instead of use effect. Uh, so here's our requirements for it. It must look and work exactly like use effect does. So it'll take a function that runs. Uh, that function might return a function of its own that we're gonna use as a cleanup function. And there's an optional second argument, which is an array of dependencies. If it's not there, it runs every time. And otherwise, it runs only when one of the dependencies has changed. So here we go. This is our hook. We're going to call it use immediate. And we're going to use two refs. Because if we want to keep track of when the dependencies have changed, 
we need to store the old ones somewhere so we can see if new ones are different from the old ones. And if the function that we call returns a function, we need to remember to call that as a part of our cleanup. So we need to remember that as well. Note that these are refs, not state, because we don't need anything special to happen. We just need to remember them within this hook. So let me skip down here. What happens here? Uh, we decide if we have to rerun. And that logic says if the dependencies were not specified or if they were specified and they're not the same as what they used to be, uh, then we have to rerun. And if we do rerun, if there was a cleanup function, then we want to call it because we're re-rendering. So we want to call the cleanup function to clean up the old stuff before we start the new one. And then here's the meat of the whole thing. We just call the function that we were passed. And if that function returns a function, then we want to remember it. So we want to stash that in this cleanup um, function ref. And then we want to save the dependencies so that we can come back and check them next time. And that's kind of all there is to it. And then we're going to say use it. So this is how we do the cleanup. Here we, we, we want to use use effect. And we want to pass it a function that does nothing but returns our cleanup function. So that's an effect that does nothing, but you want it to clean up afterwards. And that is going to happen just exactly once. And then our cleanup function, once again, says if that actually is a function, then we call it on our way out. So that's use immediate. We can write this, put it in our shared JavaScript stuff, and everybody can use it. So now we've got that. Now let's write a hook that uses that to do this API fetch thing. So fetching is asynchronous. So to avoid awkwardness, we'll do this by, we're going to give this hook a URL, and then we're going to pass it a bunch of functions that we want it to call when things happen. And so we'll build that on top of using immediate. And that looks like this. So we're going to import use immediate. We're going to use what we just wrote on the previous slide. And we're going to write a new hook that takes an object that has a URL that we want to fetch, and then three functions which are optional that say whether or not we're loading still is the API call in flight or has it completed. If it succeeds, we want it to call this. If it blows up, we want it to call that. Um, these next four lines are basically like if I leave one of these out, like say if loading, if I don't specify it, so it's not a function, it's undefined. I don't want to call uh, the infamous undefined is not a function, right? <laughs> we want to avoid that. Uh, so I just say, well, if they're not defined, if they're not functions, then we'll just call function.prototype so that we don't get an error. And then again, here's our async thing. We're going to first call that loading function to say, yes, this is in flight. Then the same thing as before. Uh, we just await the fetch and await the djsonification. And then we'll call this success function with whatever we got back. And if it blows up, we'll call the error. And then and no matter what happened, we're going to turn that loading back off. And then here's the beauty of this. Now that we've got that done, we already have the use immediate bit. We just have to say, call that function immediately upon load whenever the URL changes. So we want to fetch again if we get a new URL. That's all there is to it. Um, so now we have a hook that will manage our API fetch for us immediately. All we have to do is write those loading success and error callback functions and call the hook. So here's my component. So this is my function component. It's called greeting, the same one as we had before. That just renders this like div and stuff down here. And here's our, so all I have to do is make state to keep that in. So here's my person state. Uh, there's my loading function, which does nothing except, um, um, I make a console message here. Here's the success function. And this is the one thing it must do is it must, act, it must actually set the state for what came back from the API call. And here's our error function, which does nothing but complain on the console. And all I got to do is send all that garbage over to use fetch immediate, which we already wrote, and it's done. So what that will do, so use fetch immediate because it calls use immediate, it will initiate that API fetch the minute this starts running, even before we hand our JSX off to React. So that API call is going to be in flight before React even knows that we're done. Uh, so you can gain some performance that way. And I was surprised when I wrote this, because I'm always i always very honest. I always like write this code. Like I didn't just write that. I, <laughs> I made sure this all worked. Um, and even when, in that super simple example where I'm just calling local host, I'm not actually even going out over the net, and that component renders like a div in three spans, which is nothing. It was still about 25 or 30 milliseconds faster doing it this way than doing it through use effects, which 
in some API contracts, you know, that might make the difference between satisfying a customer SLA and not. Um, and you can imagine if that component rendered a very complex set of subcomponents that took React a long time, uh, it might be even faster yet. Um, so just if you're curious about this, so those were stripped down. I actually wrote those from scratch just, just based on the real ones. But the good thing about Canvas, which is the product that my company makes, is a big chunk of it is open source. So there's some GitHub down there and the larger production ready versions of what I just showed you are in that part of the directory tree. Uh, we wrote those a couple months ago when we were writing some new API stuff. And of course, the real ones, they have to deal with abortable functions. They have to deal with what if the component unmounts, you want to abort the API call. What if it's a paginated API that returns next meta? What if it's not JSON? What if it's a different context type? They're, they're much more complex than what I show here, but they're essentially doing the same thing. Um, so that wasn't too fast. So I'm going to certainly make these slides available somehow so you can look at this code if you want. Uh, but that's kind of the state of React hooks as I see them. They're clearly a lot more powerful now than they were and people, especially because people understand how they're being used. I found, oh man, I wish I'd put a slide. I found a site, it, it might just be called usehooks.com or something, you can do a web search for it. There's a guy who's just like, well, here's a, here's a custom hook that does this and here's a custom hook that does that. And to be honest, a lot of them were kind of like, all right, well, that's really clever, but it's clearly just for you, right? Like it's, you know, to help you out. But there's another one that called, he, he called it use media that handles like media breakpoints. Like if you shrink the window smaller, it can cause a component to re-render using different, you know, um, um, numbers of columns or something. So, but anyway, that's all I had. So I don't know if we're, I mean, I'll be around for a while. I think I ran a little bit. Yes, I ran very long. Sorry, Susan. Um, sorry about that. But that's all I had. Thanks, you guys.